are we going to have a live stream this evening? I really don't know. Um, we'll be lucky, or I'll be lucky, I should say, if I get to keep my internet connection. And as a result, I am not as organized as I would like to be. This thing's been going off and on, and it shut down at uh, about 5.30. Now it's back on for the time being, so I don't know. I'm going to roll with it until uh, I know any differently. If my picture disappears, I guess that means we're not here anymore. So anyways, uh, Motorola is celebrating, or about to celebrate, the 45th anniversary of the very first cellular phone call. The Huawei P20 Pro against the iPhone 10. Hopefully, somebody out there will be able to put those two side by side. It probably won't be me, but that would be cool. Uh, there are three features, they're saying, at least, that sell the Galaxy S9. Smugglers sneak $80 million worth of iPhones into China. So, you know, iPhones are pretty much assembled or, you know, put together, built in China, but they're being smuggled back into China after they leave. It's a funny story. Should you upgrade to 11.3? We'll talk about that. Transparent displays that support virtual reality. Well, we all kind of saw this coming, but that will also be another interesting thing to talk about. Again, uh, let's see what happens and get it started right after this. Well, no stinger. See, I told you, I am. this is going to be probably the sloppiest stream I've done because when something doesn't work, it tends to throw everything else off. So uh, it looks like I'm here at the moment. I'll try to stay here. I don't know what the problem was, but we lost internet today at 2... Uh, I'm sorry, we lost internet this morning, uh, this afternoon, right before the 2 o'clock stream. So I postpone it till 6. At 2.36... It starts working again. So I'm thinking, do I go back? But I already told everybody I was going to move it to 6. So I move it to 6, and I'm not kidding. 535, the internet shuts down again. So this is a citywide thing. Uh, my girlfriend works probably about 15 minutes from here, and her office, all the surrounding buildings, everyone lost internet. So I don't know if it's some kind of uh, North Korean hacking or what's going on, but hopefully we'll be able to keep it for a little while longer. I wanted to just start right away and not, um, you know, lose any opportunity I had to at least say hello and tell you guys that, you know, normally we do this at 2 p.m. on Monday. It's been fairly consistent. I try to stick to a schedule because YouTube likes that and it makes it easy for other people to plan around. But when your internet goes out, what do you do? You sit back and you realize how little you can actually accomplish and uh, you start doing those things that you put off that you don't really want to do but don't require internet. They're just kind of there. It's like, oh yeah, I can go do some work in the yard. I can do some work around the house. I can do some book work. But when it, when it comes to financial records or you know, I can do some editing offline, but you really have your hands tied. So I was tethering my phone and I was about to start streaming through my uh, data here on my cell phone, which I don't think would last very long because I don't have a lot of data on there. But anyways, we have Wi-Fi at the moment, so let's go with that. Um, yeah, it could have been a woodpecker, Johnny. I have no idea. It was really strange, but it was it's a huge area, and initially it took down the internet service plus the X1, which is a little voice command box they use on the TV, and then the television went out completely. So all the fiber optic apparently was offline. I assume they shut that off because they were doing some work to fix the other services. I don't know. Uh, I'm not having any issues with YouTube. Okay, cool. Good to hear. Tech for your needs. Good to see you, man. I don't think you, we saw you uh, last week. Greg M., what's going on? YouTube was also having issues. Interesting. Okay. And I know I'm reading the comments backwards here. Um, yes, and we are live, finally. So uh, bear with me for a moment, folks. I know that my windows are not going to be lined up properly here because, as I mentioned earlier, I was moving a bunch of stuff around thinking we weren't going to have a live stream. So I'm going to try to straighten that out real quick here. Let's see if we can do this preview mode again, or a studio mode, I should say, which is pretty cool because I can see stuff before it ends up on your screen. At least that's the idea. Let's see if that works. Um, no, that's not happening. How come it's still showing me? Oh, because we are on the wrong screen. So let's move this over here and move this up here. And with any luck, We'll have this window. <laughs> what just happened there? I have no idea what just happened here. That's bizarre. Um, let's see. Do we need to be over here? This makes no sense. Like, I really don't know what's going on here. This thing is... It's time for me to upgrade to a different type of um, stream management system, if you want to call it that, I guess. Okay, so now we're in studio. So how do we get over here to where you guys can see what's going on? Do we go like that? 
No, we don't go like that, Mike. That doesn't work. How about this? There we go. All right. I am almost lined up here. Let's do that. And there we go. So here is one of the stories that we saw today, I think. Eh, where'd you go? Really? Nah, like I said, I, my apologies. Everything's messed up today. Uh, but don't let that discourage you. That's the beauty of live streaming. Nothing is going to be perfect 100% uh, start to finish. In any case, here was something that I came across the other day and I really expected to see a lot more about it develop, but I guess it's upcoming. This is as of the 30th. They're saying that Motorola uh, celebrating its 45 years since the first cellular phone call, which is awesome. This is like back in the early 70s. And yes, they're talking about the brick phone. I don't know if you have seen these or ever owned one, but this was one of the first phones that I ever worked on. And I will have to say, you, you know, if you haven't heard me already talk about Motorola already, back in the day, you know, they were one of the first radio companies. They used to make uh, radios for marine applications. So if you have a boat, you te you more than likely have a Motorola radio installed somewhere. Um, and for a while, they were kind of like a ahead of everyone else. And when they got into cell phones, initially, not only did they make great equipment, but it was super, super durable. That was the thing about Motorola is you could pound a nail into the wall with this thing. And we, in fact, had Motorola reps come out to the company I was working for. They also had a program where you could go become certified to work on Motorola cell phones, which I was doing. Uh, and of course that certification is super, super old. So it really doesn't mean a whole lot right now. But the thing that impressed me the most about Motorola was that these phones, you would have thought they were like the old dial phones that we had, you know, with the little rotary dial that you could throw it across the room and it would bounce off the wall and hit the pavement and still be working. These things were super tough. We in fact had one come in just like this. This is a different style of the brick phone. This isn't the original, but it's one of the um, later generations that came out. I had a phone just like this that went through a house fire. So the phone was in the house and the people evacuated. They got out. Everyone was safe, fortunately. The phone was face down on the floor inside the house. The entire house was charred on the inside. The back side of the phone was completely melted. The battery was fused onto the plastic on the phone. You couldn't take the battery off no matter what. And it was uh, also went through the firemen who came into the house and hosed everything down, you know, to make sure all the embers are put out. And they pick up this phone and bring it in. The guy says, hey, you know, um, I'd like to see about getting this thing repaired. I'm like, are you kidding me? turn it over, hit the power button, and it turns on and makes a call. Now, we couldn't help him with that particular phone uh, because at the time we weren't at the, um, it wasn't really practical to get another donor phone, take his board, put it into that one. So we got his, his data extracted off of it. But I was impressed, you know, by that and by the original Motorola DPC 550, which was almost as durable as this thing, except for the hinge, which was pretty much the weak point on that phone. And then you had to replace an antenna once in a while. But... Uh, obviously not quite the same phone these days, but still one of the things that they had at least recently um, been getting back into, and that's the durability. So, uh, you know, the downside of that, of course, to any manufacturer is that if you make a phone this durable, it's going to last too long for most customers. So they won't need any repairs and they won't need a new phone anytime soon. Uh, LTE data is not great for streaming. Yeah, that's kind of what I figured, Johnny. I was really going to try it and see if I could even just do audio, you know, just to make an announcement on here. But I figured as, you know, as far as uploading video, that was going to be a rough one. Uh, would be interesting to see what happened. Yeah, I'm doing the inception thing. Uh, when I, every time I screw up, you'll see a whole bunch of pictures of me on the screen. Parents got one. When you were a small kid, Nate, man, I, I would love to get a hold of one of these. You can get a decent amount of money for them if they're in good working condition now, even though there aren't really any analog systems that would support this phone. It is considered a relic and kind of kind of cool to have around. We have a couple in the stores that we put out in the sh on the uh, display case. We call it our museum. And you can buy a newer version. It's a replica of this phone. And it takes a SIM card, so you can really make phone calls on it, which why would you want to do that? I don't know, but uh, people buy them. So anyone being aware of the economic haggle between here and the States and China, they see, say there will be a tariff of 200% for some imports coming from the PRC. And this is uh, this was something I did want to talk about. I don't really know all of the details. Uh, we do know historically that uh, the second Bush presidency kind of started to go down this same route and they found out very quickly that in most cases when it comes to tariffs 
the, the, the biggest negative impact tends to be on the countries that impose them. So if you say, hey, we're going to start putting a tariff on everything that comes into your country, if you do a lot of importing, that is going to hurt you more than the company that you're put uh, more than the company, more than the country that you're um, putting those tariffs against. And obviously, you'll kick off this big tariff war. And when it all comes down to it, you know, it, I think all things will be equal eventually, except that consumers end up spending more money, which is the crazy thing. So a lot of this I, you know, initially felt was just rhetoric. Uh, we have an administration now that throws around a lot of words and doesn't necessarily follow through with a lot of the things that they say that they're going to do. They change their mind from one day to the next. So you really just don't know what to expect. There's a lot of um, what they call saber rattling, you know, trash talk, and then nothing really comes of it. But with this happening, uh, it's going to be interesting to see it will, again, I believe overall just be bad news for consumers. You know, everyone else, they're going to figure out a way to get their money. They'll figure out the way to generate tax revenue. But when it comes down to us, we're the probably, we're probably the ones that will be hurt the most by this. So I don't know. We'll see what happens. But uh, I don't know if uh, this is kind of off topic as well, but. Have you guys seen this Sinclair broadcasting commercial that everyone's showing like all over the place with these um, anchor people just reciting the same script word for word? That is the thing that really creeps me out. I mean, tariffs are one thing, but when you have media, sort, you know, a media entity that goes and starts buying up all sorts of news stations, TV stations, radio stations, and... They manipulate the media in a way that, hey, anyone who listens to any of these stations is going to hear the same exact thing, no matter where you live. That concerns me. That, I believe, is, you know, probably not as bad as what, you know, what's happened with Facebook, but it's certainly um, something to be concerned about because when you talk to a lot of people who still watch TV, who still get their news from television, if it's on the news to them, it is fact. There is there is no consideration for any opposing argument. It's this was on TV. This is what my favorite anchor person says. Therefore, that's the truth. And that's the thing that we have to be careful about, especially because they've changed the laws in a way that at one point in time, media, you know, news outlets had to be somewhat neutral. They had to give both sides of a story. And we did away with that a long time ago. And obviously that should be... Um, you know, it's going to have an effect on the people that are watching. Now, the good news, of course, is that less and less people are turning to television to get their information. That's the good news. But if they're getting it from Facebook or Twitter, you know, how reliable is that information going to be anyway? So uh, as, as much as I'm against imposing additional regulations on anything like that, it's um, going to be interesting to see what happens if we don't in this in this case. Uh Sinclair Station refused to air that segment. Yeah, surprise, right? Well, I actually saw it. I want to say I saw the video posted on Reddit. It made it to the top of the front page. It's obviously been passed around on Facebook. Uh, they've been playing it on CNN. But there's really no denying that that happened. I mean, they have actual proof video. Oh, and uh, John Oliver did a piece on it as well. They've got the people on camera doing this. And it just took someone taking the effort to say, hey, let's listen to all these stations that are owned by the same company and compare their message, and it's word for word the same thing. Just freak, I mean like robots talking to you on the screen. Anyway, sorry for getting off on the tangent there, folks. Let's move on to the next thing, and that is Deal Steals offer major discounts on unlocked Motorola phones. So I don't know exactly what they're offering yet because this is the same thing. It gives us a preview, and it says, yeah, we're expecting to see this kind of discount. Um, you can update your Motorola Z Droid for just $180, which uh, sold in 2016 for $700 outright, but this is an upgrade. So obviously there's a trade-off there. You're bringing something in. There are a whole bunch of uh, companies, obviously every month or every week we see something new come out. Um, but here are some of the prices um, from last summer. So the, I don't have the numbers, unfortunately, for what Motorola is doing or planning to do right now. They just said that they're gonna be kicking off a big discount. So I'm not sure exactly what the, that will be. And I'm not actually sure if I have the correct one here. What do we have here, Johnny? Uh, let's see. Johnny's posting something in the chat. I assume that is a video. I'll have to go check it out later on, but uh, feel free to do so at your leisure. And the Huawei P20 Pro looks like an incredible phone, number one. Secondly, they are kind of following Apple's lead like 
many manufacturers seem to do. They are going to have a notch. You know, they've got a notch on the front, but it doesn't have all the hardware built in for the Face ID. So of course you can see it's a much smaller notch. The best news being that you can just shut the notch off if you don't want it. And I think that is a brilliant solution to something that probably isn't even a problem, but at least if that ever comes up and someone says, oh, I can't stand the notch or I want my phone to have a notch here, you get it both ways. Whatever whatever excites you, whatever makes you happy, there it is, simple solution, click a button, it's on or off, whatever. But on top of that, they're talking about this phone being a real rival against the iPhone 10. And uh, you know, one of the things about it being though that we do still have that bezel down at the bottom where the Touch ID is built in, which surprises me because I, you know, I figured if they were going to make this a knockoff iPhone, if you want to call it that, which it's not because this is a premium phone. I want to say this thing is going for up to fourteen hundred dollars if you get the um, the top end model. So this is not a cheap phone. Huawei, obviously, we talked about last Thursday making a lot of moves coming a long ways with the quality. Uh, if you didn't see it, we had Z from Z Reviews Tech on last Thursday's stream. You should definitely check that stream out because he is has decided to specialize in Chinese phones. And while he focuses on the budget level, he does obviously review things like this, uh, the premium phones as well. So um, it, it's really interesting to see Huawei taking this direction and saying that, yeah, you know, we know that the US government agencies are advising customers not to buy our phones. We've lost a deal with AT&T, we've lost a deal with Best Buy, but we are still going to persist and do everything we can to get this phone into the uh, US market. So hopefully that will happen. It, it strikes me as odd that anyone would pick out a particular manufacturer or product and say that, well, you have to watch out because they may be building spyware into that. There are so many devices that come from so many different parts of the world right now. And there are so many people hacking into devices that have weak security built into them. And there's no mention of that. There's no, hey, you have to watch out if you have this phone with this software version because we know that that's a compromised uh, operating system and that we know that you know China or Russia or who, North Korea or whoever else that you see as a potential adversary could be hacking a backdoor into that. We don't hear anything about that. What we did hear about though is that it looks like the powers that be, at least in the United States, want to kill this deal with Huawei, ZTE, and um, you know a number of other Chinese companies. And that strikes me as odd. It makes me suspicious, especially when you consider the fact that since 2012, uh, Huawei has said, hey, you can take a look at our hardware. You can look at our operating system. It's yours to check out, make sure everything's safe. We're selling to Germany. We're selling to England. We have nothing to hide. And still, they've lost these big deals here, which would you know represents a huge piece of the market. And this is the funny thing about cell phones. We look and we see Apple and Samsung and we always assume that those, the reason that there are so many of those phones out there is because they're the best phones on the market. And while that may or may not coincidentally be true, the fact of the matter is what really makes a difference is whether or not these companies can get their phones into wireless carrier stores. That's the big factor that's going to determine success or failure, you know, with things being close to equal. You wouldn't obviously have a super low-end crappy phone that gets into some store and if somebody goes looking for a premium phone, they're not going to turn around and buy uh, a, a blue, for example. But the difference between succeeding in the United States mar in the US market is certainly dependent to a large degree on whether or not you can get the carriers to endorse and sell your product. And for AT&T to say, yeah, we're just not going to have Huawei, that is a huge chunk. And if there's no Huawei at Verizon and there's no Huawei at uh, Best Buy or Costco or any other number of stores where people typically go to upgrade or buy phones, um, that's going to be a very difficult position for them to be in and still be able to sell their product here. So, you know, really unfortunate because again, the more choices we have, the better, the more pressure we can put on companies to make better stuff. And if we have one Android phone and one Apple phone, they can do whatever they want and we're going to take it. We're going to take that phone because we don't have a lot of alternatives. So that kind of sucks. Uh, let's see. Uh, sorry, I missed a couple comments there. Are Lenovo clearing the inventory from old Motorola phones previous from their acquisition? That's a good question. I'd like to know because there's some I would certainly pick up uh, if they were at a deep discount. The Xiaomi Mi 2S did away with the notch and the bezel. Oh, interesting. Uh, thing, who is carrying this phone in the US? I thought a bunch of retailers stopped carrying this brand. Yeah, um, I don't know, Greg. That's a good question. I'm sure that you can order one, I would assume. But as far as retailers go, I'd love anyone to 
pop a comment in there if you know of where you can actually buy this phone in a store because off the top of my head I I, I want to say that they had it on Amazon if you guys want to check that you can I'm pretty sure you can buy it on Amazon I think there's one or two other online outlets where you can get it but as far as retail stores none that I'm aware of at this point uh, why is the US government afraid of China um, well <laughs> I'm certainly not an expert on that subject and probably wouldn't do it justice by even trying to explain. But one thing that we do know historically is that any country that becomes powerful, um, you know, we have superpowers and any country that is considered a superpower or is, or is potential to become a superpower, we will be, if you want to say afraid, or we will be prepared to defend against. And we will be uh, suspicious of right from the beginning. So any any country that could militarily threaten us, those are the countries I believe that we are going to see as potential threats when it comes to stuff, you, you know, to anything. Um, not to mention the economic impact of having a foreign competitor who can come to this market and say, you know what, oh, iPhone, here's a solution and it's coming from China. Now, why aren't we afraid of Samsung? Because they are South Korean and we still have a huge presence in South Korea. We have tons of trade agreements. We have an alliance with them, I mean, you know, a number of different reasons. They are considered our ally where China, uh, you know, different story, but potentially more dangerous to us uh, militarily and economically. I hope you won't, don't quote me for that. That's the way I understand it. There's certainly someone else out there who could uh, explain it a lot better than I can. Do Galaxy S5 displays start to fail after more than four years of continued use with flickering? That is a good question. I knew I do know that screen burn-in is an issue on a lot of Galaxy phones. In fact, I've seen more than one Galaxy S4 that was used as a demo model in the store that just, you know, the icons don't go away. You can still see them. And we've tried all sorts of apps to try to refresh that and get rid of it. I don't know about the S5. Um, that's a good question, though. Johnny, but it has been quite a while. So if anyone has one and doesn't see the screen burn in yet, then uh, that would be a good sign. Did you hear that Mobile Defenders is working with Motorola and are selling OEM screens straight from Motorola? I did not. John Cassidy, I did not hear that. So Mobile Defenders, that's interesting. Um, but they're only selling Motorola screens, I assume. That's cool though. But I did have a Motorola rep contact me and show me an application that they developed or, or is in development, I'm sorry. It's not released that I know of yet, but I had a Motorola rep call or contact me. I did a conference call with them and he showed me an application that Motorola came up with to demonstrate how to repair phones, which I thought was interesting because while I it got me excited about the fact that Motorola is saying, yes, we're going to say repairing your phones is a good idea. Here, we're going to help you learn how to do it. Uh, as you can imagine, that tutorial was designed pretty much for someone who wasn't familiar with phone repair. So it was more like a consumer level, you know, here, take out these two screws, do this. I mean, I guess I guess ultimately every phone repair tutorial is something like that. Um, so that doesn't surprise me that they would be working to sell OEM screens through uh, distributors that aren't Motorola themselves, which would be good news. And I haven't heard back from that rep either. I invited him to come on a live stream and he said he had to check with the office and um, you know, most of the information that he gave me, I was able to talk about. There are a few things that he didn't want me to mention, and I'm going to respect that, you know, until I hear differently from, from him. But I believe that, you know, obviously, um, from what you're saying there really, um, confirms what, you know, the impression that I got. And is, that is that Motorola is not opposed to us or anyone else repairing their phones. So that's good news. And hopefully we'll see some legislation pass here in California. You'll probably see those phones are Best Buy or Fry's Electronics. Uh, which phones? Best Buy is pulling them. Yeah, Best Buy pulled the Huawei, uh, if that's what you're talking about. The P20 Pro, not going to happen. It's one thing to have a retailer carrying the phone, but it's impossible to get warranty support. Yeah, it's another. that's another downside to uh, a lot of phones that don't have any sort of you know service center in the U.S. That is a tough thing. And that could be a sign of things to come, unfortunately. Uh, because here we're still owing money, money to China's central bank who loaned us. Uh, okay, so Johnny had a brief explanation there regarding China being a problem for the U.S. Because here we are still owing money to China's central bank who loaned loaned to us to bail out the automakers from 2008 crisis. And right now China is the country who has the more cash after the EU. Well, wow, interesting. Uh, the thing is U.S. cellular network uses switches made by foreign companies and I guess potential is spying on the comms. Yeah, 
that that's the other thing. Um, and I brought this up last week. And if you weren't already aware, one of the things about Huawei is that they supply. Listen to this. This is just suspicious to me. Huawei supplies switching equipment for smaller ISPs. So we've got the big companies. We've got Verizon. We've got Comcast. We've got AT and T. We've got you know the big three or four companies that are providing internet for a lot of people. But we've also got smaller companies here and there, especially in more rural areas, you know, probably um, closer to the heartland in the U.S., that buy their switching equipment from Huawei. And if they are no longer able to acquire that equipment, then one would assume that eventually these larger ISPs will come into that area and say, oh, well, sorry, you can't do the job. We're here to solve it for you. And that would reduce the amount of competition that they have. So that, uh, you know, and also there was, there, was a, there was another related story to that that um, Ajit Pai had come up with, another bill. I'm going to have to pull it up and get back to you. But um, the whole thing kind of goes back to the FCC sort of cooperating with large ISPs and saying that, yeah, it's okay if everyone only buys from these three companies and we kind of squeeze out everybody else. That's the impression I got. So... Uh, for what it's worth, I would recommend, I actually tweeted that recently. Let me see if I can pull this up real quick. Uh, can I do it without this thing? This is going to be tricky. Let's we'll see if I can see if I can open another tab elsewhere. No, you're not going to let me do that, really? Uh, of course, that's going to happen. All right, let's try this. I thought I could get this thing. There we go. Okay, so let me pull up this story real quick because I think this might kind of speak to what's going on with... Um, with the whole Huawei situation and why it's going to be difficult to get their phones and other things. So this was, yeah, so this was an Ajit Pai, my favorite, where'd he go? The FCC says it will block Chinese technology to protect national security. And if you read the article, which I will put again down in the links of this video, along with the rest of the links, and you can see it from last week also, this was something that was proposed by the FCC. Ajit Pai was in charge of it, and it was just kind of a let's get China out of the market so that we can sell more American stuff here. And that could certainly not do any good for Huawei. So, uh, you know, interesting. But there's always, you know, if you follow the money, as they say, you'll usually get the answer that you're looking for. Okay, the word here is government. Neither country's citizens could care less. And that's a good point. Most people, as long as they get their their iPhone or their Samsung or their Facebook or their cable or, you know, their uh, Netflix or whatever, they could really care less uh, what it takes to make that happen. I agree 100%. Are Galaxy phones and iPhones even supposed to last longer than four years? No. <laughs> I'm going to say probably not. Uh, you mean Motorola is actually listening to customers? Maybe. Maybe Motorola is seeing an opportunity here to do something different that the other big manufacturers aren't. That's just my guess. Uh, let's see. I just factory re reset a Galaxy S5 from a friend of mine who has it almost for four years and it's showing its age by way of slow boot time. And that's probably, Johnny, that's more than likely going to be due to the fact that it's running the latest operating system, which is probably not designed for a Galaxy S5. And we certainly run into that on any phone. You know, when it comes out of the box, it's built with 1.0. And by the time you get to 7.0 and you upgrade to that, it's just not built to handle, you know, that operating system is optimized for a current flagship phone or maybe a year or two back. So if you take something really old and put it on there, it lags a bit. But I'll I'll say I got uh, 10, I think it's 10.3, 10.3, 10.3, something like that on an iPhone 5 that I just restored recently. And it runs decent. It's not terrible. I was really surprised by that. Will Apple copy the trend of multi-camera phones in the upcoming iPhone? That's a good question. Uh, da, 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 da. Why don't they just have a warning about how the Chinese government, government might look at your information instead of just banning it? Yeah, it's a good question, especially when the Chinese government can certainly look at your information now uh, in one way or another. I'm confident of that. You know, Considering how careless most people are with securing their devices, their wireless network, uh, you know, their communications, you name it. I assume any foreign government that really was looking at a person of interest, you know, some 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 person that they had uh, financial or political gain to, you know, by getting information about that person. If they're not in a very secured environment, you know, obviously anyone who works at the White House, you know, hopefully any government official would be taking precautions against that. 
but the average citizen probably doesn't. So what's stopping them from spying on you? Probably because they don't care to would be my assumption, which is why it just surprises me, you know, are we really supposed to worry about Huawei spying on us? Like what would Huawei or China have to gain by spying on me? I can't think of much, you know, unless they were trying to find my uh, my pin code to my ATM card or my, you know, my bank account information. I really don't know. It's a weird thing. Anyhow, uh, three significant features that sell the Galaxy S9. If you don't want to guess, I'll just go ahead and give them away right here. Um, again, you can. this is on Forbes. You can see the article. I will put the links and the timestamps for all of this information in the video description by tomorrow evening. I'll try to do it tonight if I can. It takes a little while. It's a little tedious, but let's jump right to it. Variable aperture. Uh, so that's interesting. You can control the aperture here and shift between f. 2.4 and f 1.5 number two and i know i'm going to run through these a little quick because we're uh, we're going to be kind of behind schedule a bit here camera has its own memory so this is an interesting one and i don't know if there are other phones on the market that i can think of right now that have that but um besides having four gigs of ram they apparently or i'm sorry aside having what is it six gigs of ram on this thing i lost my place here Okay, so four gigs of RAM on the phone, they've actually got memory specifically for the camera, which means that you can take multiple shots and they'll be stored on the camera until they're processed into a single image that is represented, or this process, or is presented to the user. Uh, slight changes in circumstances coupled with Samsung's processing software allows for more detail and contrast to be discovered while reducing noise and shake. So that's cool. Uh, super slow-mo, and we talked about this earlier when um, right around the the CES time where we're going to have or will have 4K video at 60 frames per second, 1080 at 240, or 960 at 720. And if you've seen the advertisements and the commercials and the demos of this slow motion, it is pretty amazing. So that I'm really excited about because you could do some fun stuff if you have a real slow-mo camera with a high frame rate. And if you haven't ever watched any of the slow-mo guys videos, they're really oddly satisfying i guess to watch it's fun to watch things catch on fire impact and you know throw them in the air and uh, burst water balloons and all kinds of stuff like that with the slow motion camera and now you will be able to do something very similar i don't know um if it which really compares to the camera that they're using but one thing that we tend to see with phones is that they get so much you know they advance so much from one year to the next that you take a look at your phone of today and a camera of two years ago and think wow you know i think i'm happy with the phone so this is really cool for uh android customers of course if you're going after a galaxy s9 unsurprisingly the chinese phones have a more open approach for those who like to hack and explore the innards of their roms oh interesting all right so 80 million dollars worth of iphones smuggled into china now this one i thought was kind of strange and I, I again i don't know a whole lot about chinese economy but apparently the way that this works is that the phones were actually in were they in hong kong uh the phones were between hong kong, hong kong and shenzhen so shenzhen is where a lot of the stuff that we get the replacement parts um, a lot of the apple stuff you know manufacturing goes on there and here's the thing Apparently in China, it is not easy to get an iPhone. And when you do, you will pay a ridiculous price for it. Because if we look at a phone that costs a thousand dollars here, apparently buying that same phone in China, when all is said and done, including taxes, uh, tariffs or whatever it is that they charge, a thousand dollar phone in China can cost you up to $3,000. So what these guys did, this is wild. You have to, you have to read this if you haven't already, what these guys did is they took drones and they flew a drone between, you know, presumably over a border between two buildings and they stretched out a tether between these two buildings, connected it at each end. And then in the middle of the night, they use like a pulley system and just move the phones across from one side of the border to the other. And apparently we're doing this for quite a while. They've arrested 26 different people that were involved. They had 660 foot cables between two high-rise buildings and passed as many as 15,000 iPhones per night across the border. So, you know, at a savings of $2,000 per phone, obviously that makes sense, you know, uh, you know, breaking the law, so not justified, but 
from a profit standpoint, you know, you can see the motivation for someone to do do something just like this. And it blows my mind that they have a border. When we talk about securing borders, they have a border that close with buildings that close to each other that you can stretch a line from one, what is it, 600 feet, did I say? Uh, 660 feet and you're on the other side of the border and you just push phones across. I mean, I thought they were flying them in initially, but they, they flew this line across, secured it at the, at the other end, and then just the old thing you would, you know, um, if you've ever seen an old movie where they take a message or something and move it from one window in an apartment building over to another, same thing, very primitive, and we'll probably see the same thing happening on the U.S.-Mexico border at some point, if we haven't already, uh, although I don't think there's any big buildings right there, but um, yeah, that's the phone he That's the phone heist. Well, it's not a phone heist, though, because if I understand this correctly, they acquired the phones legitimately on one side of the border and then smuggled them back into China so that they could, you know, probably make a ton of money selling them there at a much higher price than what they bought them for outside of the country. So, uh, let's see. One cable was stretched between the buildings. The smuggler sent individual packages of 10 phones across. Working in the dead of night, they were able to pass as many as 15,000 phones per night over a six-month period that added up to 500 million yuan. I'm not sure if I'm saying that right, but uh, $79.8 million in refurbished phones, and apparently that's been shut down uh, since they've found out about it. Do you have an older iPhone? There's an upgrade with good news, maybe. Okay, so we all know this is coming. We've been talking about it forever. Uh, iOS 11, where you can update and turn your battery throttle on and off should you do that immediately. I would suspect that if you're having a lot of problems with your battery, you might consider doing that if the alternative of replacing your battery is not an option at this point in time. But here's the thing to keep in mind, number one, uh, 11.3 I should say, number one, iOS 11 has probably had as many or even more bugs in it as any other operating system, uh, you know, at least in recent times. So for that reason, if you're worried about your phone being stable, you may want to wait a little while on this one. Typically when Apple does a major upgrade like this, they will do another upgrade shortly after because the this one will more than likely cause a bunch of problems. They're already talking about what those problems are. So um, the good news being that you will be able to shut off that throttling option. And the bad news, of course, is that we really don't know how stable this is gonna be or what types of bugs will develop over time. So unless you're in a hurry, uh, I'm certainly not going to upgrade mine at this point sometime in the near future and then get back to you on that. And of course, if you have a jailbroken phone, when you upgrade it, you will no longer be jailbroken. So something to keep in mind, and I'm sure that anyone who has a jailbroken phone already knows about that. A lot of goods, uh, more cheap in Hong Kong than in Shenzhen, and they're just a block away from each other. That is so That is so strange. I mean, it makes sense. I understand, you know, with borders, you have different laws, you have different uh, tax rates, you have all sorts of stuff going on, but to be that close together, it's it reminds me of the situation here in the U.S. where we have the Mexican border, which for a long time was simple to traverse. You know, you could walk across and walk back all day long and buy tequila and leather and silver and all sorts of other uh, merchandise on the Mexican side of the border and walk right back into the U.S., drop it off and go get more if you wanted to. And, you know, before 9-11 and especially before recently, they were pretty relaxed about people coming and going. Obviously, that's changed a lot over time. Last time I went to Mexico, they stopped us at the border, asked a bunch of crazy questions, opened up the trunk, looked through our suitcases. So, you know, that's that's kind of changing a bit, uh, especially with recent immigration policies. But at one point, we, we had the same situation going on here. You go to Mexico and you could get prescription medication for a lot less than what you would pay here in the U.S., which was... Um, a strange situation, but a benefit for a lot of people who couldn't afford medication, you know, because of the cost of prescription drugs and the amount of taxes that we pay on stuff like that. It made sense for a lot of people to make a monthly or a bi-yearly trip down to Mexico, stock up on their medicines, and for a while you were able to bring that stuff back into the U.S. And now they have quite a few restrictions on what types of pills you can uh, move across the border, obviously. So uh, that's changed, but it makes sense when you look at something like Shenzhen and, you know, um, and electronics and being that close and just saying, okay, we'll just move this across 600 foot line and there you have it. I have a replacement battery from Mobile Defenders. It doesn't work well at all. It says service. Is that bad? That's interesting. So I'm assuming that when you put the new battery into your phone, it says uh, the 
iOS is telling you that you need to replace the battery. Is that what's happening? Uh, no more jailbreak since the half of iOS 10 series. Yeah, and I've still got one on 10.3.3, which I believe is jailbreakable that I haven't even bothered with yet. Not sure if there's much of a reason to at this point, uh, but there could be in the future. That's the thing about it. You know, once you get jailbroken, or if you have a jailbreak broken device and you know that there's not probably going to be another jailbreak solution for a while, even if you're not using it, a lot of people to hold, tend to hold on to it thinking, well, you know, just in case I want to change something or do something a little differently. But I agree, there's probably not a lot of justification for jailbreak at this point, at least any that I can think of. Oh, John, I'm curious to hear about that. If uh, Oh, it's under, yeah, so I should have mentioned that. Uh, they actually had it settings and battery or um, settings and battery, right? Sorry, it was here just a second ago. Yeah, settings, battery, and it starts with the iPhone 6 and up. So if you want to go in there and turn your throttling off, you can do that now. Uh, should you upgrade though? That, of course, is the question. And this is basically another article that says, well, you can, but, oh, here we go, a few deal breakers. Uh, obviously, it will wipe out your jailbreak. What about stability reports? So far, they are predictably heated for a major release. Perhaps the irony for an update focused on performance and battery life is that there are multiple reports of the former and latter causing problems. And that that's an interesting way that they're numbering this. Um, there are also not noticeable graphic glitches. One, two, three, five, Apple Music, one, two, three, four. Uh, bugs and false notifications, particularly in messaging apps as well as truly bizarre invisible keyboard problem for some users and random Siri activations. Uh, and I think that was about it so far, but we never know exactly what's gonna happen. And I'm interested to see what we end up with as it, it appears that they are combining all of these multiple lawsuits that people had filed against Apple into one big class action suit. So that'll be interesting to see if they end up paying out on that. And I'm sure that whatever the award ends up being, it will be, you know, maybe more than a drop in the bucket, but not something that Apple isn't going to be able to recover from quickly. So if we happen to see their do their stock dip again, when that ruling is made, it might be a buy at that point, just saying. Um, doo -doo -doo. iOS 11.3 kills 20 bugs, brings in 40 more. Eh, that sounds about right. I would expect that to happen. So we have patents being filed or have been filed for quite a while by both Apple and Samsung for transparent displays. As you can imagine, this would f make a lot of sense as we are seeing um, that we're more than likely heading into an augmented reality uh, environment. But I still question, and, it, and there are reasons to believe that Apple is probably... Uh, going to be heading more towards something that is a wearable instead of, you know, walking around holding your phone up, even if it has a transparent display. And of course, there are a number, number of issues that would be introduced with that. You know, number one would be where are you going to put the battery? Because if you have a transparent phone, you've got to have some space for the hardware. You know, you've got to have a motherboard inside there. You've got to have a battery, which is at this point in time, taking up a considerable amount of real estate on any phone. You know, any phone that you open up, you're looking at what? Probably 65, 70% of the phone is battery uh, outside of the display itself. So it'll be interesting to see how they're going to work this, if it's going to happen. But um, when that time comes, you know, you picture a lot of things like you see in the movies now where people have a transparent display. There are numbers that are showing up on the board and you can go to a museum, you know, and make it look like an animal is coming to life while you're there. I'm not sure how exciting that's going to be. Who knows? But it, uh, again, there are strong signs that Apple will probably be heading more towards a wearable, you know, some sort of glasses that you put on that work in conjunction with the processor on your phone to create that augmented reality environment. I'm sure they won't tell us what the details are on that until it comes out. Um, why don't, let's see, why Apple don't put whimsical names on their phone OS as Android do iOS whack -a bug perhaps that would be a good, that would be a great name. And it's something that I'm wondering right now, because after you go past 10 on a generation of anything, you know, we've got the iPhone 10, we have the galaxy S nine will almost definitely have a galaxy S 10. But after that, where do you go? Cause it just starts to sound silly and at the same time, kind of boring if you're going to have like an a iPhone 11, iPhone 12, iPhone 16. You know, there's nothing that really will set that apart. And 
you know, the fact that they went with the Roman numeral kind of makes sense because this was the anniversary phone and it was a big deal and it stands out from the others. And you even kind of created a buzz by having people calling it two different names. You know, a lot of people call it the iPhone X, other people call it the iPhone 10. Uh, for a while, we thought it was going to be called the new iPhone. But what do you do after that? What's the next name going to be? I, I agree. I think it would be cool if they had something that was a little more, I don't know, not animated, but a little more friendly to to say and, and not make it sound like a machine. Because that's what we're doing. When we look at an S9, S10, you know, P20, iPhone 10, whatever it is, it really sets it out as a piece of electronics as an inanimate object, right? And with people developing voice assistants and trying to make phones seem more friendly and putting face ID and emojis and all that, I'm really surprised that Apple hasn't come up with more of like a pet name for their devices at this point. So maybe that will change, maybe it won't, maybe there will be an iPhone 11, but it seems like this would be a good opportunity, you know, the next generation, the next iPhone that's released to move on to something that's friendlier, if that makes sense. Just my opinion, that is just my idea. Apple doesn't have a mascot, that's a good point. They need one. I thought Tim, uh, what's his name? Isn't Tim Cook the mascot, sort of? So this article, this is Business Insider, is calling the newest iPad the most boring iPad yet. I'm not saying it, they are. I'm just reading the stuff that's in front of me, folks. But at the same time, if you look at the specs and everything that's going on with it, there's not a whole lot that really sets it apart from the other iP or from the previous uh, version, um, as far as the 9.7 goes. We do have the Apple Crayon and the Apple Pencil, of course. The crazy thing about it being that one, you can get this tablet pretty reasonably priced. I want to say it's about 330, right? Uh, let me scroll down here and find it. I want to say it's 329. Yeah. So uh, the new iPad is priced the same as last year's model. You can get it for 330. But if you're a school teacher or student, you can get the uh, the new iPad for $300, a whole 10% off, and you can get the Apple Pencil for 10% off, so it's 90 bucks instead of 100. So we're talking about, and it's not included. This is the thing that kind of blows my mind. You buy this new iPad, we've got the new iPad Pencil, but they don't come together. If you want it, it's an extra 100 bucks for most of us, and that is almost a third of the cost of the entire tablet, so that's kind of crazy. They're saying that a lot of people probably don't need the pencil. You can probably get by with the crayon, which is 50 bucks instead of 100. So unless you're doing graphic design or you need to have super accurate uh, drawing on your tablet, the crayon will probably do the job. Now, the cool thing about the pencil, of course, is that it can sense what angle you're holding it at. So you get all sorts of different um, uh, impressions that you can, you know, different things that you can draw on the surface. So that's, that's cool for some people. I don't think it's really for everyone or definitely not something that everyone needs. But if it were me, uh, what is this? Yeah, you buy 10, you get one free. There you go. Yeah, Steve Jobs, the mascot, pretty much. Uh, but other than that, again, at least according to this article and what I've seen so far, not a whole lot about the new iPad that is going to be next gen, you know, uh, uh, hey, look, look what I can do now. Well, you can do a lot of what you could before. It costs a little bit less. But outside of that, um, let's be fair at the same time. What do you expect from a tablet? You know, what, what do we want to see next? in a tablet. And the funny thing about this is as I was going through this article, I was kind of at the same time reading another one. I know it sounds crazy, but I'll have two articles on the screen and I'm kind of scanning and looking for key information here. And some some one of these articles I came across mentioned the 3D touch on the iPhone. And you want you know when I hear what's crazy to me? I have had an iPhone for at least a year more than a year. I mean I got my iPhone 7 probably a year and a half ago I want to say. And I can think of maybe two occasions where I've used 3D Touch on the screen because outside of that, it tends to just make the phone do things that I don't want it to. And I completely forgot I even had that, I had to test on this iPhone 8 and make sure it even has that feature. I know it does, but I can't remember ever using that feature on the phone. I'm curious as to how popular that is. You know, if we could get a percentage of how many people use that and how often. I suspect that it's not nearly as exciting as Apple probably hoped it would be. So are we at the point now where there's just not a lot of exciting features that are practical at this point to say, hey, look what my phone can do. Because if the most exciting thing about your device is that now it has facial recognition, for those of us that don't really use facial recognition, it's like, okay, so I basically get last year's phone with a faster processor, that's usually the thing, and upgrade the camera, I suppose. The iPhone with an 8.4 megapixel front camera, portrait mode still in beta. Actually, 
Let's see, actually, Apple have to adopt a snake as the mascot in reference to the Eden Garden. I was going to add, okay, I was about to ask if that was a snake or a worm, but that answers my question. Yeah, that would be a good one. Um, and, of course, will never happen because you could see Apple not wanting to represent themselves as a snake in the grass or anything similar. California welcoming zero unmanned self-driving cars after only one company applies for a permit. So California recently passed a law that says that, yes, we can have self-driving cars on the road with no drivers. And as you can imagine, timing not so good after the Uber incident in Arizona. So it doesn't look like um, that will be happening anytime soon. And if you didn't already hear, there was another problem with a not completely autonomous vehicle, but we had a Tesla that was involved in an accident down uh, near San Jose where the entire front of the car is ripped off. And the driver had previously complained that the car was having a difficult time at this particular median as far as, you know, basically seeing that the median was there and not trying to head towards it. And that's exactly where the collision took place. So it's very strange. One, that Tesla wasn't able to do anything about it, according to reports. You know, I have to say that. You can't say too much about any company um, as an authority. So I don't know the details. I do know that the articles that I read stated that the owner had complained about this car in this exact same area on this same freeway. Tesla was not able to come up with a solution for him, but at the same time, he ended up being involved in an accident there. So it makes me wonder why he did not choose to you know, just pilot the car himself and not rely on any of the assistive features that were built into it, knowing that there was an issue in that area. Very unfortunate for him. Obviously, we don't know the entire story, but supposedly Tesla did release a lot of the information about that accident. And then uh, there were people who weren't real happy about that. So, um, you know, what we should be doing here, of course, is working together, all of these companies. And this is one of the things where when we talk about, you know, proprietary information and keeping things inside the company and not letting your competitor get an advantage and fighting against right to repair because, oh, someone's going to come in here and make the same phone that we have if we tell them how we built this thing. Okay, that's one thing. And I'm not saying I agree with it, but if we start looking at things like self-driving cars and we have a problem with these cars and we figure out that they can cause harm to people or property Shouldn't we have some sort of law in place that says you guys all need to cooperate and share information and figure out how to prevent these problems and figure out to prevent loss of human life? I think that we would have a huge argument that says, you know, you need to cooperate together and, and trying to keep proprietary information that way when there's any possibility that we could prevent people from being harmed by sharing the information um, there's no question in my mind that that is the right thing to do, you know, competitive or not, you know, we have to make sure that these cars aren't running into people, especially when we know that the statistics support the idea that having autonomous vehicles on the road, even at this point in time, when we've seen these accidents happen, is still a safer bet than letting people drive their own cars. This is the weird thing. This is what we've reached. We know statistically that the self-driving cars are safer most of the time. So overall, they will save more lives, but that comes with the trade-off of them not being safe in certain situations where we expect them to be more dangerous. So it's a weird it's a weird paradox here when you say, well, we're going to enter into this area where we know people will get hurt, but it's for the greater good because much, you know, many more people will be saved, will be not hurt because of this. So what do you do at that point? And obviously there will be a lot a lot of ammunition for anyone who wants to fight, you know, wants to say no, and opposes this in any way and says, look, we already know that these cars aren't safe. They caused an accident, somebody died, deal's over. Well, but at the same time, how many accidents are caused every day? And how do we have a, a fair comparison? Because if you took the, you know, any random driver off the street his skills and his propensity to be involved in an automobile accident are going to be quite different than probably the guy that's right across the street from him in another vehicle. And then compare those two to a self-driving car. And what do you do? You know, how do you argue that? What is the right answer to that? We know if all vehicles were automated, many more people would not lose their lives. 
But if that happens, we know that these cars still have a problem and there will be loss of life. So it's a bizarre thing. I, I don't look forward to the day when you walk down the street and you have to worry about what kind of car is approaching you and why. Like I know that in this environment, I'm at risk from this type of car. Does that car have a driver in it or is it automated? I don't know. Does it have a big sign on the front? Do we have an app that tells us that tracks self-driving cars in real time so that we know to avi avoid them? I, man, I don't know the answer, but um, interesting times to be going into. Does self-driving cars or are, so I'm assuming are self-driving cars affected by a Bermuda Triangle effect in some places? What? <laughs> I don't know what that means, Johnny. Does Is Apple still interested in self-driving car as they team with BMW in the past to do so? Um, that one I don't know either. And it doesn't, as far as I know, I haven't seen any information about Apple working on self-driving cars recently. I know that they were for a while. And as far as I can tell, the information that they're sharing with us at least doesn't seem like they're talking a lot about self-driving cars at this point in time. I could be completely wrong. So if anyone has information that says differently, I would be interested to hear it for sure. One blessing about AI-driven car is that there will be the end of bottlenecks and gridlock. Everything will move with bullet balletical smoothness. Is that a real word, Johnny? Because if it is, I'm going to start using it. Balletical smoothness. Um, or ballet, balletical? I don't know. Uh, that That is so true. If we had automated car, if we had self-driving cars that worked, there would be no traffic jams. And if you haven't seen how traffic jam work, traffic jams work, I'll try to find you this video. It's brilliant. And it's basically because impatient people do the wrong thing because they try to pass one guy and they start this chain reaction that's ridiculous. And it's just, it's it's silly, but people do it all the time in order to reach their, de their destination 12 seconds earlier. And then everyone ends up being late because someone caused this chain reaction. Uh, but with, obviously with, with self-driven cars, we shouldn't have that problem. That would be great. We'll be faster, more efficient and fewer people get involved in accidents, which I am am looking forward to that day. Although, giving up driving your car would kind of not be fun, I think. If you grew up doing that, like we've, I've always enjoyed driving. I don't enjoy, enjoy the long distance drives as much now, but there's something about driving a car that is, that I think I would miss. I think a lot of us would. Not all, but some people. AT&T has a buy one, get one iPhone for, uh, I'm sorry, let me try to say this again right. AT&T offering buy one, get one iPhone or 99 cent iPad with a DirecTV subscription. So if you've been waiting all this time to buy an iPhone 7, now's your chance. Yes, this is what it is. When I heard about this, it sounded too good to be true. I actually heard about it from a friend and I said, no way. There is no buy one, get one, Apple, anything. That doesn't make sense to me. And then I went to read the small print, and here it is. First of all, you can get a number of different phones. You can get an SE. You can get an iPhone 6, 6 Plus, 6S, 6S Plus, 7, and 7 Plus if, if, while supplies last. So if they're in stock, you can get one of these phones on this buy one, get one free. Uh, however, you must subscribe to or upgrade your contract with DirecTV. And they're, uh, let's see, what are the other catches here? Um, eligible phones, upgrade to the 128 iPad, 128 gig iPad for only $99. I don't know if that's the new iPad. iPhone must be purchased on AT&T Next. So you'll be upgrading your contract with your carrier. So you get to agree to pay them monthly for the next two years iPad requires a two-year agreement, so you're locking the iPad into the two-year agreement also, if I'm understanding. Yes, and activation. So you've got to renew your contract or sign a new one and put the iPad on a two-year agreement. So you're going to be paying for a separate data plan, if I'm not missing something here, uh, and activation on a postpaid data plan. So yes, you're signing up for data on a second device. You must activate a new DirecTV service within 30 days of your mobile activation and I would assume if you've got DirecTV, you can extend your contract by another two years for that uh, to satisfy that requirement. And a one-time bill credit will be applied to your account within two to three billing cycles, and you'll be paying for the rest of this over the next 30 months. So um, if that does excite you, uh, you want to get in on that while you can. My understanding is that some locations have run out of some of these phones already, which is not a huge surprise, but to go and buy an iPhone 7 now that does su surprise me. That seems like something that would be designed for someone who just needs an iPhone, not really too picky about how old it is, and they can finally say that they've joined the, uh, Team Apple. 
Uh, let's see. Hey, if you're on the freeway, go the speed limit, not 30 miles below it. Hmm. Uh, new line. New line. Come on. Where's the love for adults? People who love had phones for years. Yeah, that's the thing. Um, I don't know. It's a good question. But anytime I see buy one, buy one Apple, anything, get one free, you know there's a catch. Here's where it is, and it's not exactly what I had in mind when I read the headline. Uh, this is not too exciting, but I thought it was noteworthy, interesting to talk about. You know those little touchpad things they hand around at the restaurant now instead of having you swipe your card or taking your credit card and swiping it for you? Well, obviously, all of these touchscreens come into contract, contact with every customer that uses them, not just you. So the bottom line here, of course, is that they are covered with bacteria not only from your server, not only from other customers, not only from you, but probably from kids that play with them when they're sitting on the table and everything else. So my advice would be, A, um, wash your hands after you use the touchscreen on this thing. But secondly, I guess hope that your server and your food prep person is washing their hands after they touch this thing too, which I'm guessing they may not be able to do may not be realistic to request that they do that, but they do have big things of hand sanitizer built into lots of restaurants uh, now that they can use. So I, I don't know that they will, but it would be a nice thought uh, to think that they do. Although when you go out to eat, you want to assume a lot of things are happening, which may or may not be, because if you didn't, then you wouldn't want to eat out. Uh, not to mention if you have ever visited the back area where they prepare the food in the first place. So I'm not gonna stay on that one for too long. I'm not gonna stay on that one either. And that is just me talking. So I think we did it in 59 minutes. Wayne Taylor made it here just in time for his pizza tops. I still haven't got those and I would like to. I think that would be the coolest thing in the world to have a pair of basketball shoes that could order a pizza. In fact, if I had one, I would hit the button right now. I'm getting hungry. Um, pizza with boobs. That'd be an interesting one too. SpaceX is going to bring satellite Wi-Fi somewhere in the near future. That will be interesting if we... Satellite Wi-Fi. Now the question there is that I understand downloading, but uploading something to a satellite is going to take a significant base station, uh, not something you're going to be able to, to connect from your phone to a satellite. You'll have to have some way to upload. So if you've ever seen the old satellite phones, uh, one, they've got to be outside. So I would I would envision an external antenna on your house that can make contact with the satellite. And presumably in the beginning, it would be very expensive. And then, you know, over time, costs would come down, hopefully. I would hope. I would hope. We shall see. All right, let's shut this off right here because you have seen enough of that. And we did it. I was only four hours late, but I honestly can say this time was not my fault. My ISP was on and off. And the strange thing was right before I started the stream, I thought it was going to happen again. And it came on just in time. But we made it today. Sorry about the timing, folks. I will do this next week at the regular schedule, 2 p.m. We'll be back this Thursday at 6 p.m. Not sure about the guest lineup yet. I'm still kind of waiting. It's it's very challenging um, for people to make Thursday night at 6 p.m. Uh, who are YouTube creators for whatever reason. So I don't know if that was bad planning on my part, but it is what it is. Hopefully we'll have uh, a guest come on. If not, I've got lots of other people lined up that we'll have in the following weeks. I'll be making those announcements soon. I wanted to say there was another announcement that I was going to make, and I can't remember what it was, but I will keep the chat open for the last, next few minutes in case that does uh, enter my mind. Like I said, I got kind of thrown off by this whole internet connection thing. Let's see, I believe we are caught up on the chat. New Like My Words of Love for old uh, for adult people. Thank you all for joining me. I will see you uh, hopefully Thursday, 6. And if not, then I will see you on when? Next Monday, 2 p.m. ISP permitting. We'll see. I hope this thing stays on. I don't know what happened. There must have been some kind of store storm, traffic accident. I don't know. You guys take it easy. I will talk to you next time.